Welcome back, my name is Arya and I don't waste your time, so let's get straight into it. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's video, we're going to talk about Lululemon Athletica, which is the biggest loser in the S&P 500 from January until now, so year to date. And their stock is down, as of today's open, it's a little bit higher, but uh, as of yesterday, they were down 40%. So in today's video, we're going to analyze Lululemon from both a qualitative and a quantitative perspective to try to determine whether it's a company that can outperform on a going forward basis, especially after the massive, massive sell-off that this business has gone through. I think it poses as a uh, buying opportunity. So as you guys know, I do like to first analyze the moat of the business and try to determine the qualitative aspects of the business before we dive into the numbers. And with that being said, I watched one video from Modern MBA. I watched one of these videos about how Lululemon's very, very unique marketing strategy in the retail space. I highly recommend it. I'm gonna link it in the description. I think you should check it out right after this video. But on top of that, I wanna go over some of qualitative aspects of Lululemon, which I'm gonna refer you guys to the Morningstar report. So in the Morningstar report, they actually talk about the premium pricing that Lululemon has. So if you didn't know Lululemon, which makes, of course, the uh, various different yoga leggings, they make the hoodies, they make uh, various different athleisure products. Recently, they started doing shoes since their inception they've actually been pricing above nike so nike they come in at roughly nowadays like 40 to 50 maybe 80 dollars whatever the case is and lululemon has consistently priced just a little bit above nike and they've been selling like hotcakes i think the past two decades of this business is highly evident of that the morning star report here says lululemon premium pricing allows for high gross margins providing support for a narrow moat rating the firm has achieved gross margins of 55 percent in every year since 2018 this is absolutely incredible so restaurants and retailers alike usually they're in like the 30 to maybe 40 percent gross margin the only one that's really comparable is actually nike themselves and they say lululemon's five five year average gross margin of 57 percent significantly exceeds that of many competitors and they give you examples here they talk about nike adidas gap urban outfitters right all, all these different competitors in the retail space and in the clothing space they have significantly better gross margins and if you didn't know gross margins it's simply the cost of goods sold so it's the cost of actually producing the leggings or the hoodies or whatever the case is right and it doesn't take into consideration the overhead costs such as your rent fees or your utility fees or actually having the store open and all, all the different costs incorporated with the store itself it's simply the cost of actually the leggings that is being built right so they make leggings for 40 dollars and they're able to sell them for a hundred dollars moreover the firm generates much of its revenue through sales of higher margin apparel price around a hundred dollars per unit in recent years lululemon has reduced its dependence on women's yoga pants with new products including clothing for men 23 percent of sales footwear and fitness leisure clothing for women but what we had right there is over time they kind of diversified the revenue away from just being focused on women's yoga pants and that's what they've like historically done right like they were just known as having the most premium most high quality yoga pants and i highly recommend if uh, just talking to a woman in your life whether it be your mother your sister girlfriend wife whatever the case is talk to them about lululemon and ask them why why would you why would you buy Lululemon over like, I don't know, H&M, right? Like it's just leggings at the end of the day. Like, is it really that much better? Is it the quality? Uh, is it how it feels? Like it's, what's the situation there? Why, why would anyone even spend like 150 bucks on a pair of leggings, right? And I think every single person would respond to you, oh, well, you know, if you buy H&M, like realistically it lasts you like a year, but then if you actually go and buy Lululemon leggings, the quality is of the utmost fabrics and therefore, it survives years and years and years. And speaking of the quality, over here in the Morningstar report, they say, although fabrics cannot be patented, its signature Luan fabric was developed two decades ago and was trademarked in 2005. That's the moat. That's the moat right there. So pa uh, patenting and uh, actually having uh, something trademark is like different. And I'm a little bit hazy on what the laws actually eat means. But I think if you have it patented, it's like the Crocs chemical that's used in, uh, by the way, check out that episode. It was a great video. But the, the actual uh, Crocs shoes, the chemical that is used and the plastic that is used to make those shoes, that's completely patented. They like outright own it. So uh, whenever you go to like Walmart or something and you're actually wearing the Walmart Crocs, like it feels different. It's not as comfortable. It's because it's not the same chemical, right? With Lululemon, it's not exactly like that situation. They have it trademarked, which is slightly different. I'm going to put the definitions on the screen. Having it trademarked, they still own some uh, stuff around like the name of it and being able to market it and all that type of stuff. So I, I think that does add a little bit to the moat compared to something like, I don't know, Urban Outfitters or The Gap or whatever, right? Like they don't have that fabric that they've built a brand on top. Its apparel is designed to be bacteria and smell resistant and survive many washes. The material in its apparel is significantly more expensive than in traditional athletic shirts and pants partly accounting for its relatively high pricing, right? So this is the mode of the company. They're able to price above Nike and they've done that sustainably for like 
the past two decades. Because of that, they've had outsized margins, outsized profit, outsized revenue growth, and have built a brand of being extremely high quality. I think that's a great position to be in the retail space and definitely a position where it could last for decades to come. Jumping over to FinChat, I want to go over the fundamentals of the business because, of course, we could sit here and talk about the moat as much as we want. But if the business isn't growing, they don't have proper margins and all that type of stuff, it's not worth your investment dollars. One thing to do before we actually talk about all that, I wanna set the stage by talking about where the revenue is coming from. So over here in FinChat, after you go into the segment and KPIs area, they actually uh, show you by geography where the revenue is coming from. So namely, most of the revenue of this business comes from America's revenue. That includes United States and Canada. So roughly 75% of total revenue of this business comes from that region. And additionally, they've actually made a very big push into China, similar to many of the other discretionary companies. You got like Starbucks and Nike and Estee Lauder and all those other companies. They've also been really pushing to go into China. And this is because uh, China's middle income class over the past like five, maybe 10 years has actually started to gain access to a lot more disposable income. I think this is a very good strategic move for the long term and could actually be one of the uh, reasons behind the profit drivers for this business. They've made a push into China. China, as it stands currently, is roughly just shy of 10% of revenue. And then the rest of the world, also about 10%. And then additionally, if we look at the different revenue streams of the business, they got roughly six billion from uh, women's products. So again, that's the, the dominant revenue stream on that front in terms of product makes up about 55, maybe 60% of the business. And then men's products, you're looking at 2 billion. So that's maybe closer to like, I don't know, high teens percentage. And then additionally, this is actually something very interesting that I noticed. It's a complete 50, 50 split between people buying clothing from Lululemon in stores and buying online. So direct to consumer DTC, that means uh, on their website. And then of course, uh, company owned operated stores. That's also 50%. Very, very interesting. And I think if I remember correctly, Nike's in like the 20% range with their direct to consumer. So the Nike online stores that only accounts for like 20% of revenue. So I don't know, this could be, this could work both ways. It could be that maybe they, they don't have too strong of a store presence, but additionally on the flip side, if you look at it, it's significantly higher margin to actually ship stuff to people's houses, as opposed to have a uh, store with like lots of overhead, lots of employees, electricity bills, rent expenses, and all that type of stuff. Right? So interesting things to note. Nonetheless, I think it is a positive for the business. One last thing that I want to do on FinChat before we move on here, I want to talk about the revenue growth and the free cash flow growth of the business. So historically revenue growth, as we just saw in the Morningstar report has been incredibly strong. They've grown revenues at a 20% compound annual growth rate over the past decade. That's absolutely incredible. And additionally, the free that's translated to very strong free cash flow growth. And that's been roughly in the 27% ballpark. But of course, as we know, the market is forward looking and it doesn't look in the rear view, right? So we need to know what this business is going to do on a forward basis. Now on a forward basis, it's not as rosy as what is done in the past decade. So in the past decade, growth has been strong. I'm not denying that. But it seems that as Lululemon has saturated its market in the United States and as they've grown and become more mature in the United States, going international isn't going to be as big of a tailwind behind their growth as it's been in the US, right? And we talked about this in the Alta video as well. I said, moving down to Mexico, sure, it's great. Sure, that means there is a um, big uh, total addressable market there that they could uh, possibly start selling to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the growth is gonna be just like the past 10 years, right? Same thing applies to Lululemon. Going international doesn't mean the same growth. And I think the analysts agree with me here. So they've said revenue uh, on a two year forward basis is gonna be roughly 11% and then earnings per share or free cash flow growth let's just say uh, roughly in the same ballpark, that's roughly in the 12, 13% range. I tend to agree with this. So I think, sure, it's been 20% in the past, but I think we're gonna see a slowdown in both discretionary income and additionally moving to international, that's gonna drag the growth of the business. One last thing to note here before we actually jump over to valuation, the net cash position of this company. This company has a very cash rich balance sheet. And actually, if we take a look here, I believe, I think this is a data issue here, but yeah, they have roughly a billion dollars in debt, but they have $2 billion in cash. And it's not like a incredibly big market cap. It's only a $40 billion company, right? So that definitely contributes to the enterprise value of the comp of the business. So at last, the elephant in the room. The reason why you probably clicked on this video is the incredibly cheap valuation that Lululemon actually trades at. And to take a look at this, and especially compare it to historical, I'm going on a website called Finance Charts. I'm not affiliated with them or anything like that. But as you could see, we were able to pull up the historical PE ratio and PE ratio is something that I've been very critical of in the past, but I think it's appropriate for Lululemon because they've actually done a significant amount of capital expenditures in the past. So when you toggle on the cap, uh, the free cash flow of the company, uh, that way of valuing the company gets a little bit skewed. It's had like price of free cash flow of like 600 
at some points. So anyways, looking at the PE ratio here, we're able to see that in the past 10 years, there's been very rare times where Lululemon has actually traded below a 30 times PE. And today on a trailing basis, it's at a 25 times multiple, right? And especially if we toggle on the 15 year time frame for this, again, you could see that there's been very rare times where Lulu has actually traded below a 20, uh, sorry, a 30 times multiple, let alone 25 where it's at today. And the way we know this is we could actually take a look at the average PE ratio chart of Lululemon over the past 10, 15 years. And you can see that it has held its premium valuation for a very, very long time. Now, What's important to note is has the company fundamentally changed from 10, maybe 5, 15 years ago until now? And I would say that it has. I think the revenue growth and the free cash flow growth of this business isn't going to be as strong on a forward basis as it has been in the past. And I think in the past when it had significantly stronger revenue growth, it deserved a higher multiple. And is the current drawdown in multiple warranted? That's for you to decide and see whether it's, whether you're comfortable with that. But in my opinion, having the multiple have just because the growth has had, I think that's pretty fair. Now, does that mean that Lululemon isn't going to be a good investment going forward? I'm not sure. <laughs> it might not be. It could be. But what I could tell you definitively is the fact that the multiples have and so has the growth. Now, last, jumping over to my valuation framework. And essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the current valuation of the company and we're dividing it by how fast we expect the company to grow at. So if we have roughly like the 11% revenue growth or whatever, and we could even go into the earnings here and they've grown at roughly 10 to 11%, I think... This is probably going to continue out into the future, just simply based off of same store sales growth coming in at like six, 7%, even if that slowed, slows down, right? So having that as a backbone of your growth, additionally, maybe you tack on a little bit margin expansion, maybe you tack, sorry, not margin expansion. Additionally, you tack on a little bit like price increases and uh, new store count opening and all that type of stuff, right? Like you get to the 10% revenue growth rate. Like it's not too big of a hurdle to pass up. And then on top of that, when we're talking free cash flow and earnings per share, you tack on a little bit margin expansion, which I'm a little bit hesitant on to rely on that. But then on top of that, they like buy back shares, right? And I think going forward, if the shares are going to be cheaper compared to the past, I think they're able to buy back more and more shares. So you land at roughly, I'm saying like a 12% earnings per share or free cash flow growth rate on a going forward basis. And with that, if we simply just drag down the formula here, you would see that it lands roughly about fair value on my valuation framework, right? So I don't think it's like a screaming buy. But at the same time, compared to the historical valuation that this company has traded at, I think it's probably a better value proposition as it stands currently with much less expectations baked into the stock price than historically. And especially when you consider that maybe, you know, they go international and they're actually widely successful, or maybe maybe we come out of this mini recession for the discretionary companies and all of a sudden revenue growth picks right back up. All of a sudden they're growing revenues at 15%, right? So th this type of thing could happen in the retail industry, especially if spending comes back and if people start buying $150 leggings like there's no tomorrow, there is a lot of upside that you could capture on top of that. So I wouldn't blame anyone buying into the company as it stands currently. It is a very cheap valuation, especially comparing to historical. But at the same time, for the amount of growth that you're buying, I would just way rather buy a company like Salesforce, which I've been buying continuously the past couple of weeks. But nonetheless, you could see that for the amount of growth that you're getting with Salesforce, like expected, of course, so there's always risk with that. It is a software SaaS business, so is it really too much of a risk? But anyways, you can see with the amount of growth that you're getting from Salesforce compared to Lululemon, it's much better to buy that business over this. So you have the opportunity cost of owning more Salesforce and maybe diversification purposes, but I'm not a big proponent of that. Now, if you like the fact that I don't waste your time, I'd like to ask you to do something that costs you nothing. If you could hit the subscribe button, I'm going to continue to post high quality videos just like this one. It could always go back on that decision if you end up not liking the videos, but I highly doubt that. Thank you for watching and have a great day.